Hello friends and welcome to uh, the first video in our Science is a Verb unit. Here we're going to talk a little bit about the scientific method and how that scientific method works. So this is a picture of all of the sciences right here. Here you can see them all. And we're going to focus for this course on this one, right, which is chemistry. And chemistry is a great subject to learn, but the nice thing about science is that they all basically work kind of the same way. And that's really what we're here to talk about in this unit, which is what is the process that scientists use to figure out what's going on in the world and in their particular field of study. So let's dig in a little bit, shall we? So the first thing that we should point out is that there's a whole bunch of stuff that science tells us about how the world works, and we can call that science as a noun, right? That's a body of knowledge that science has discovered. And I think that that's really important. Uh, I certainly like learning about it. You probably like learning about it. We all very much like all of this knowledge that science tells us about the world that we live in. And I'm not trying to say that that is not really worth focusing on, but we're going to spend the rest of the course basically focused on that. So right now I thought maybe we would instead focus a little bit about science as a verb. So this is uh, the scientific method, we might call it, which is really that verb, the way of doing science. And you all probably really know this by heart at this point. I'm, I'm sure that any one of you could probably tell me all of these different steps down below, and you could probably recite them. And that's great, but I really think you should start to understand that this is not really how science works. I mean, it is in a large sense. But what I mean to say is that when professional scientists get together to do their work, they're not working through the steps of the scientific method in sequence necessarily, if even at all, it's totally appropriate to start at any point in this process and to go to any other point in this process to work your way through. So it's nice to use this scientific method as a way of thinking about it, particularly when you're learning about it. But here now, as we move into an honors curriculum, as we move into an advanced way of understanding, it's totally okay to understand that, in fact, this is not always the way that science is done, that we can really start at any place and move to any other place in this process. Now, that's not to say that there's anything wrong with science as a noun. I'm sure that we all really enjoy living in a world that has been basically built by science and the technology that it's brought for all of us to use. Um, I certainly like the fact that I live in the modern world. I'm sure you all do, too. It would be distinctly less appealing to live 200 years ago when people didn't know about the germ theory of disease, much less have electricity that they could use um, whenever they wanted it. What I want to do at this point in our discussion is to really focus on moving past this scientific process. And I really want to look at two major parts of this and see if we can figure out ways that we can extend our understanding. I really want to look at the hypothesis part of it, and then I want to talk about sort of the conclusion aspect and one little tweak that I want to make to your overall language. Let's start with hypotheses. So let's use this as an example, all right? So here's one light bulb that works, and here's one that doesn't. And what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to write down maybe three really good hypotheses about why these light bulbs are or are not working. So pause this video, take a moment and write them down, and then look at them and see if you can understand kind of the threads that they have in common. So I'll wait for a second. You can hit the pause button, and then we'll move on. Cool, so let's take a look at these hypotheses and see if we can see anything in common. You probably can identify a couple of themes. What I really wanna point out is that if they are good hypotheses, they'll have maybe three major things in common. The first is that they'll, they're testable. What I mean by that is we can do things to see if they are in fact correct. So if a hypothesis for why the light bulb was out was the power switch is off for that light bulb, I can test that by going and, and looking and seeing if that power switch is in fact off. And all of the hypotheses that you have come up with for this light bulb probably Probably are testable. Where it might not be testable is something like a malevolent spirit wants his light bulb to be off no matter what I do, right? That would not be something that we can develop a test for, and so it probably wouldn't be good grounds for scientific inquiry. But fortunately, there aren't too many malevolent spirits that really interact with our light bulbs on a daily basis. The second part of what makes a hypothesis a hypothesis is that it's predictive. If I say that this light bulb is out because there's no power going to it, I've predicted that that in fact is the case. I can go and investigate whether or not my prediction is supported by reality or not by looking and seeing whether or not my light bulb is plugged in. And the last thing that I'll make clear here is that they're all statements, right? Every hypothesis is a statement of what's happening. It doesn't end in a question mark. It really shouldn't end in an exclamation point. It just ends in a period. So a testable predictive statement is really what we're looking for with the hypothesis. And I'd hope that if you look at all of your hypotheses, you see that those are all testable predictive statements as well. Of course, if they're not, I would encourage you to go back and refine them. See if you can turn them into more appropriate hypotheses for this particular examination. Now, of course, we're not actually going to be investigating 
light bulbs all that much here in chemistry. And so the things that we'll be investigating are a little bit more related to the science. And so you've probably been taught that you can start your hypothesis with if, and then put in something that you'll do, and then put in the word then, and then put in something that will change as a result. And you can still use that if you want to. But what I want to make the point here is that this kind of phrasing of a hypothesis is again, this notion of a training wheels to help you develop as a scientist. And that if you look at actual science, it's not like you get to academic journals and you see them writing hypothesis if blah, 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 then blah, blah, blah. So if you're cool with moving past this if then hypothesis phrasing to something a little bit more mature as a scientist, go right ahead. But if you still wanna use that, you absolutely can continue to do that. I'm not trying to say that you shouldn't, particularly if you're not comfortable yet thinking beyond that. I'm just trying to get you to start thinking maybe a little bit beyond that. Now let's go to the end of the scientific process and let's talk about this notion of science and proof. So you probably think that the job of a scientist is to prove things to be correct or not. And here is my news for you. Proof is not something that we should ever use as a concept in science. Scientific thoughts are by definition not actually provable. They're testable. They can be supported by experiments. They can be supported by hundreds of years of experiments and findings in all sorts of different fields, at which point we would call these scientific thoughts theories, but you can never conclusively prove any piece of science. The only place in humans investigations of reality where we might be able to prove things is mathematics. And we can debate whether or not mathematics is actual reality or not. But so, you know, Euclid could use proof, right? You've learned how to use proofs in your math class. And if you haven't, you will soon. In science, you really want to get rid of that word proof. It's okay to say your hypothesis is supported. It's okay to say that nothing has ever refuted the theory of evolution, for instance, in the last 150 years of investigation. These are all totally accurate statements. But you never want to say that you've proven something to be correct because that demonstrates a level of certainty that's really beyond the scope of science. Now, of course, science does in fact work in that the way that we investigate our world generates testable predictions, which we can use to develop technologies and our understanding of the universe that are held up over many, many generations and have improved our lives immeasurably. So even though the theory of the atom is just a theory and it can't be proven conclusively to be true and it's always being refined, it provides us with an understanding of the universe that enables for things like electricity and medicine and materials working and all of the other places where our understanding of the world is informed by atomic theory. So that's okay. We can acknowledge that and we should acknowledge that, but still this word proof is something that we really want to get rid of. So that's basically all I wanted to talk to you about in this video. This notion of science as a process, but one that is a lot messier than maybe that classical scientific method that we're all used to. Some discussion of how to build hypotheses in order to uh, better our understanding of what they actually look like. And then a little conversation here about this word proof and why it doesn't belong in science. If you have any comments or questions or concerns about anything that you've seen here, please either leave a comment below the video or you can get in touch with me through the information in the info field down below. All right. Thanks so much. Take it easy. Bye.